Hey there, Jeremy here. Welcome back to another episode of The Stock Factory. As you may have noticed, this is not a regular episode of The Stock Factory. I have just had the absolute pleasure to have a really candid conversation with the CEO and Managing Director of Lake Resources, Stephen Promnitz. Honestly, got so much out of this discussion. Really fantastic to hear his insights around the future and current sort of challenges at Lake Resources. And so without further ado, I think that you guys are really going to enjoy this. Let's get into it. Well, Steve, great to meet you. Thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate no, you coming you. and meeting appreciate you face it. to face. It's really refreshing. No, it is. And I, I appreciate the opportunity. Fantastic, Steve. Well, look, I know you have a flight to catch after this. Would you mind telling us a little bit about, you know, what you're up to? Uh, well, as you're probably aware, Australia has been the hermit nation. And um, it's only a week ago, uh, 1st of November, that uh, New South Wales threw open its borders to international travel. And then today, 8th of November, Singapore is opening, and so is the US. Uh, and on the 1st of November, Argentina opened its borders. So I can go to site, I can go and see our bankers in London, and I can take them to site and also catch up with our technology partner in San Francisco. So that's the idea. Fantastic. And essentially with our new team in place, mm -hmm. who many of which, um, apart from our long-term people, I've only met virtually, I can actually go and see them face to face, talk to them about what we want to achieve as a company, mm -hmm. what we want to see as a culture, and then uh, also take the bankers to site. They do their initial due diligence, initial uh, meetings, and then they'll follow up again, probably February with the second visit. Fantastic. And you get an opportunity to build those relationships face to face as well? Absolutely. I mean, that's the whole idea. Yeah. And as the company grows, it's very important that you keep mm. those key themes mm -hmm. because when you have a small team, it's quite easy. Mm. But you know, as you add more people, we've got to say these are the things we want to actually deliver on. Absolutely. Well, thanks for sharing and have a great trip. Before we get into the questions here, I do want to be one of the first to congratulate you on becoming a billion dollar company. Yes, it's. Um, <laughs> I have to say it's a great uh, it's a great thing to achieve, mm. not so much in of itself, but it means that you actually uh, reach a point where institutional funds can actually look at you, look at the volume traded, and then actually consider an investment in the company and always having a way out. Um, it just sort of makes it a little more real. It's the same mm -hmm. with off-take partners. If you go to an off-take partner and you're a $50 million company yep. versus a billion dollar company, it, it doesn't, it just makes the dynamics a little more meaningful mm -hmm. from their perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It gives you a little bit more leverage. We could Yeah, and, and just a little bit more seriousness. Mm. Mm, I appreciate that. And in relation to like, you know, all of that funding and investments and whatnot, I really appreciate the bonus options that you offered to your retail investors. Um, I know around 70% of us took up that opportunity and looking at where the share price is today, absolute bargain. I uh, really, really appreciate that in terms of what you're giving back to your diehard retail investors, we could say. Well, uh, there's, um, there's a method behind mm. it. And it was that uh, when we did a capital raising in January this year, 2021, mm -hmm. uh, we did that in the space of a few days, organized by Roth Capital out of the US, and we uh, chopped that out to seven institutional funds. Mm -hmm. And that was great because the share price was going up, um, the lithium price was going up, and we did that. But there were a number of shareholders that said, hey, what about us? And we had done a year earlier, we'd done an SPP, a share, excuse me, a share purchase plan, mm -hmm. but you can only buy 15 or $30,000 worth. Whereas the advantage of the bonus option is that uh, essentially long-term investors can participate now and they can participate in the growth of the company. Mm -hmm. There's an additional option as well, so they can participate in that. And that's a way where instead of just getting institutional money in, you actually then share it with retail, high net worth, uh, and some funds, don't forget, they, they also participate in it. So, true, true. Uh, and it's one of the last few offerings that the ASX and ASIC actually allows. Most of them have been cut off in the last 20 years. Right, interesting. Wasn't aware of that, but... We'll Thanks see how long <laughs> they last. Um, I was concerned that we would do this and maybe a couple of others will, and then and maybe then it's not available anymore. Well, I appreciate it in the first place. Thank you. And I know the community does as well. So as you know, Steve, I'm a big fan of Lake Resources, the story that you've got to tell, um, your value proposition. Um, and there are many aspects of your value proposition, which 
you know, I'm very optimistic about, especially in the future. There are a few small aspects that I'd just like to clarify with you, um, just to make sure that we can invest with the most utmost confidence. Mm -hmm. uh, the first of which is you've got your direct lithium extraction process. You've used your pilot plant in California um, to run some samples of that. The question I had is, what does the sort of, uh, I, I guess the process of scaling up your uh, direct lithium extraction process look like at Kachi? Oh, yeah. and, and what are the sort of difficulties that you're gonna experience around that? Certainly. Um, well, let me take a step back. First of all, just on the process itself. Mm. You've heard me say before that iron exchange is very well used for 70 odd years. Mm -hmm. What Lilac has done is just adapt it for lithium. Mm -hmm. And so the trick with iron exchange, or actually all of these direct extraction processes, is just to do the test work. And to be blunt, at benchtop scale, you can actually adjust things to sort of make them work. But as soon as you start at a pilot plant scale, it's much harder to do that. And when we say a pilot plant, this is like the size to give your audience an idea, this is like um, about the size of three garages. I mean, these things stand four and a half meters high. You know, they're not they're not dinky. Yeah. Um, and the middle of last calendar year, uh, mid 2020, when we saw that the lithium chloride, that's a product that comes out of it, was actually better than what we saw at benchtop scale, we thought, right, we're onto a good thing here. However. We did third party work with Hazen to, to show the high period of lithium carbonate. They used a very simple process. Then we used Nivonics to demonstrate it worked in a battery. Okay, so that's a background. Moving forward into the demonstration plant, to a certain extent, what happens in one module works in five, it works in 20, it works in 50. Okay. So there are engineering challenges behind that. You've mm -hmm. got to make certain you've got enough brine going into it, that you mm -hmm. can take the brine out, that uh, you've got enough supply of beads, all those sorts of things. Yep. But the actual process itself and its scalability, we're not particularly worried about. Fantastic. Because all we're doing is treating water. Okay, it's a very salty water. To give you an idea, the brine is about eight to ten times the, the saltiness and salinity of seawater. Uh, and it just has that 1% or less than 1% with the lithium in it. Mm -hmm. um, but all we're doing is processing water. And unlike when you're digging a hole in the ground uh, for a hard rock mine, where you know, what you might get at one end of the pit is different to the other end of the pit, you'll get some variability between holes, but you know, holes that may be two kilometers apart or five kilometers apart, you're actually not gonna get that much difference. You're just basically just pumping water out, mm -hmm. putting it back in, taking your lithium out as it goes along. Uh, and so we're fairly comfortable that the demonstration plant will work fine. Mm -hmm. And then as we scale up to production of 25,000 tonnes per annum and then to 50,000 tonnes per annum, the actual DLE part, mm -hmm. we're not particularly concerned about. Fantastic. Now, why is that? Mm -hmm. It's A, okay, it's relatively simple, but B, the risk issues that you could think of, are we not going to pump enough brine? Mm. All right, so we will always have maybe three or five production wells that we could turn on so you've got enough brine. Um, can we not re-inject it uh, fast enough? All right, so we'll have some additional re-injection wells. Uh, maybe that might add 5% or 10% to either capital costs or operating costs, but we're not talking like some flipping disaster and it doesn't work. Um, the same with the actual recovery. So in our PFS, we've averaged 83.5% recovery. Mm -hmm. So that's based on about nine months of those beads working. It just depends whether it's nine months or 12 months. Gotcha. But yeah. that was back when lithium was around $10,000 uh, 10, a tonne. Mm -hmm. As it moves through 15 to $20,000 a tonne, maybe it's more economic to actually change those beads every six months and you're always working between 90 and 95% recovery, okay, it costs a little bit more, but you're getting that much more lithium out. So it becomes an economic driver. So you can see that as we've done our risk analysis, it's not like, oh my goodness, the thing doesn't work. It's more, how can we optimize it? Absolutely. And changing out those beads on a more frequent basis, would that have a effect on your ESG benefits? No, no, that, it, won't, it won't affect that. It's just, um, that's just a, an operating cost. That's Understood. All. Okay. Full stop. And as the price of lithium carbon equivalent goes up, it becomes more viable to change those out more regularly? Potentially. Right. I'm, I'm saying potentially there mm. because I have to leave that to the engineers to actually optimize that. 
I am curious around the sort of best aspects or the strongest aspects of your management team. Like you guys are doing something that never has never really been done before sure. in a sort of large extent. Um, and ultimately, you know, we're all people um, and we're not just investing in obviously, you know, yourselves and your technologies and, you know, your, your tenants. It's, and it's around who's driving it. Exactly. No, I, and that's a very good question. It, it probably wouldn't surprise you that most fund managers, they do their review of the project, but before they invest, normally they actually want to meet management. Mm. So it is a key issue. Um, we set this up from scratch six years ago. So we um, acquired the ground, we came up with an approach to how best to do that. Uh, then three and a half years ago, we were looking at ways to best develop it. That's how we came across Lilac. Um, so the team has essentially built around that. And that's been good. We've got had great support from our chairman, for example. Stu uh, has been out sort of campaigning regardless. Mm -hmm. uh, Nick is um, very measured in his approach and he's been great with the PFS and now the DFS. And that's got us through these difficult times. Let's not forget the middle of last calendar year was just, I mean, it was the valley of death. It was almost <laughs> rope around the neck stuff, just trying to keep the thing going. Absolutely. And you almost have to pinch yourself that here it is 15 months on and you're a billion dollar company when you, know, you were barely 30 million then. But now we're at that key stage where with debt financing in place and with the equity markets open, we're trying to build out that team. We've had a very solid team. We've had just sort of one or two, five people to that have done the exploration that have helped us with the studies. Mm -hmm. uh, you saw our recent announcement putting Gautam in as a COO. That mm -hmm. guy's great mm -hmm. because he's not just an engineer who's worked on other projects, but He's worked with communities. He understands the importance of the social factor when you're developing projects. Because you can have a great project, you can have the financing in place, but if you're not working with your local communities, I mean, the whole thing can just blow up in your face. We're not a large company that can just say, okay, well, we'll park that one up and we'll get our next one going. No, we can't afford that. Mm -hmm. So um, he's been great with that. And what's good is that then he will... Uh, inculcate the team with that importance that, yes, we have to deliver on these things. We've got to look at what the DFS says and make certain we, we look at the critical path and make certain we're acquiring the right um, uh, equipment. But at the same time that we're working with local communities, that everybody is focused on social outcomes, on environmental outcomes, that we do follow appro appropriate governance guidelines because and that's what's important going forward. The consumers of electric vehicles want to know that those vehicles have got all those attributes. We're not trying to repeat the sins of, uh, yeah, of internal com yeah. combustion engines again. Absolutely. Uh, and look, we sort of put that mantle on and have driven it. I have to say up until the last 12 months, most of the time, I would just get an eye roll and say, for goodness sake, Steve, why do you bang on about it? I said, this is where things are going. You know, get on the bus. Uh, and so we've been fortunate that now almost every presentation I go to, not just the lithium sector, but across natural resources, there's something about, you know, ESG outcomes or, or using renewable energy, what have you. You go, okay, finally, we're starting to see some changes. Amazing. And so in relation to that approach to obviously engaging with like local communities, what can you tell me about the overall company culture? of lake resources like you know that's your management team what do your employees look like what do they do you know in terms of the way in which they approach working for lake okay so as you started we're mm. all just people you know we're all just trying to get by if you've got a family you just want your kids to get a good education yeah. and it's the same in argentina mm -hmm. argentina they've had a pretty tough time so uh, prior to covid the, um, the financial and economic situation of the country wasn't looking that great. Mm -hmm. uh, and they've had to then deal with COVID. And on top of that, they've had inflation or, or devaluation of their own currency. So it hasn't been easy. Yeah. And so, you know, if you wave enough greenbacks, sure, you'll get people to join your team. But we always say to them, if you're going to join with us, please understand that we're not doing what everybody else does. Um, we don't see direct lithium extraction as that different, but it is different. So you've got to understand that that's what we're going to do. It is different. 
And when we engage with communities, even though that may occur elsewhere, it's not as common in Argentina, but it's critical. See, I grew up on a farm. And if somebody turned up and wanted to dig a hole in my backyard or in the back of the farm, naturally, I want to know what the hell's going on. So it's exactly the same. Absolutely. Um, and, and OK, we're not talking huge numbers of people, but at the same time, they've got a livelihood there. Mm -hmm. And it's quite common for companies to turn up and say, oh, we're going to give you benefits. But sometimes I don't really want those benefits. I just want to keep my own life going, maybe have a couple of extra bills in, in my back pocket, but essentially continue my own way of life. And that's what we're trying to do. And yeah, and as a result, you're lifting up those communities, you're employing a larger amount of people. Better social outcomes, more jobs in the area, mm -hmm. increased infrastructure, um, better outcomes when it comes to power, internet, things like that. And at the same time, you're delivering a product that's got a smaller carbon footprint for the, for the car makers and their mm -hmm. consumers and you're producing a higher quality product for the battery makers. You're not taking the water out of the sort of brine resource below as well, you're putting it back I, in. And the thing is, and I'm not going to um, cast too many aspersions on the traditional evaporative process, mm. because at the moment with the demand, we need all of these lithium projects. And all we're saying is, look, all of these have to be developed hard rock, uh, brine evaporation and DLE, but if you're looking at those, this is just a better way forward, a better quality product, better outcomes. And the thing is, um, uh, traditional brine evaporators argue that that water isn't potable. You know, it's heavily saline, it can't really be used for anything else. But over time, if you keep pumping out of a basin, Mm. Naturally, your, your, um, your water table is going to lower. Yeah. The scarce amount of fresh water that is available in these hyper-arid environments either becomes less common or it's further from the surface. So uh, I, I actually don't buy that argument. I say, well, if you can just put it back and really don't change things, mm -hmm. isn't that a much better outcome? I completely agree. And considering how long it takes to actually get that water table to those levels in the first place, uh, Most of it is ancient water. Most of this water was actually deposited before the last change in climate, before the last ice age. Wow. So a lot of the water there is 20 to 40,000 years old. It's incredible. And it is topped up a little bit by some snow melt, but mm. you know, that's, the, that's actually the age of the brines. Yeah. Yeah. And it just shows how important it is to kind of put it back and leave the place as you found it to a relative extent. Yeah. Amazing. And um, moving on from here, Steve. I also wanted to get your thoughts on essentially some alternative technology. So the idea is that obviously, you know, there's this massive disconnect we keep talking about between lithium carbon equivalent uh, supply and demand and underinvestment in new supply um, and how stark that sort of difference is, is yeah. quite concerning. So we can assume to a relative extent that lithium carbon equivalent, the price of that is going to increase quite a bit over the next decade. With that increase in price, I think the viability of new technologies, alternative technologies, potentially things like sodium ion batteries and such are going to be, I guess, more and more important. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on, yeah. on that. So obviously I don't know. All right. Yeah. Um, otherwise, <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd take a position or what have you. But if we yeah. just look at what normally happens, if a price goes up significantly mm. and so it becomes prohibitive, people want to reduce the amount of that product in the battery. Let's look at cobalt. Cobalt went up a lot. We saw Elon Musk and some others saying, how can we reduce the amount of cobalt? Mm -hmm. Because that's the highest cost item in the battery at the time. Yeah. If you had asked me five years ago, and it was something I used to bring up with the that great team at Benchmark Mineral Intelligence, mm -hmm. I used to say, well, what are the competing technologies? Five years ago, we didn't know what was going to work. It could have been lithium ion batteries, but there were a few others. What's changed is that at the end of this calendar year, there's going to be, I think it's 151, I'm sorry if to the benchmark team if I got that number wrong, but I think it's 151 gigafactories will be functioning at the end of 2021. Mm -hmm. And the current target is about 247 uh, come the end of 2030. So there's all that hundreds of millions that are being invested into that and when you've had that volume of money invested in, the opportunity to then quickly change that technology is limited. Absolutely. 
However, mm. um, there will be some competing technologies. You've mentioned some of them. Uh, the most obvious one will be solid state batteries, but it won't compete down in the EV space because they'll be quite expensive. That'll yeah. be going into aerospace, defense, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And the Japanese have spent quite a bit of money on it. Um, and I suspect that there will be some lower cost alternatives in batteries as well, but they'll sort of just add on rather than, oh my goodness, now we're going to use this technology. Look, that's my view, um, but that was my view four or five years ago as well. So uh, I'm always looking at either how we can do something better mm -hmm. or what could cause problems. Because you've got to understand in this five or six years we've been putting Lake together, the demand from the end users has changed significantly. So the demand for high quality, you've heard me bang on about that. Mm -hmm. More recently, the demand for ESG outcomes. Yep. Um, but, I mean, we're not going to be in production for two and a half, three years. Mm -hmm. Probably the, the demand will change again. And then in the first five years of production, perhaps again. Mm -hmm. So we're looking, okay, if we're solid state batteries, what sort of product could we produce that would help with that? So we've been looking at that with our expansion case. And if there was an alternate technology, what sort of products go into that? Because the consistent thing has been lithium. Mm -hmm. It may replace lithium, but one of the benefits of lithium, it's right up there on the top left-hand corner of the chemical <laughs> periodic table. Yep. So that means it's the lightest metal. Mm -hmm. And that's why it wins when you get to vehicles. Um, uh, stationary power, uh, for renewables, that could be an alternative. Yeah, so do mine seems like a, a relatively good choice for uh, at-home and, batteries. And if we can get stability in that mm. sodium ion, mm. um, that would be a good outcome. Understood. And Steve, you know, the, the entire sort of demand, as you just mentioned, has changed um, coming from battery manufacturers, electric vehicle manufacturers. In terms of a potential offtake partner, the dynamic in terms of those conversations has changed, I assume, quite a bit over the last 12 to 24 months. With that in mind, you're now in a position where you can choose who you most want to work with. What are the characteristics of an offtake partner that you most prefer? So 15, 18 months ago, we wanted to get a tier one or possibly a tier two battery maker. Mm -hmm. uh, why did we want to do that? Because we saw how with Oracobre's development five or six years ago, they got through exploration, through development into production. Mm -hmm. And that's a big tick. Mm -hmm. Not many companies do that. Yep. And they had a good asset. So that's another tick. You, doesn't matter what technology you use, you've got to have a very solid asset to start with. But they also got a great offtake partner. Mm -hmm. And then when they went through difficult times uh, last year, 2020, they were selling their product at a loss, $1,000 a tonne loss. Now, that's not how you make money. But... Their, tech, their, um, their offtake partner supported them, and it's just a sign that if you get the right partner, that when things are tough, I mean, relationships aren't made when the wind's at your back. They're made when things aren't that great. Mm -hmm. um, so we've always been focused on trying to get somebody from that category. We've been fortunate, as you've heard me talk about the quality, that helps to get them. And more recently with the ESG, the electric vehicle makers have focused on that. Now, that is actually fairly new on the cathode and battery maker side. They've sort of gone, yeah, look, that'd be a nice thing to have. But whereas particularly the EU-based uh, vehicle manufacturers, they do want to see that ESG. And it's not a nice to have. It's actually right down to their financial bottom line. So given that, it's interesting that BMW uh, did an offtake with Livent up the road from us in Catamarca mm -hmm. province. That was back in March. And the reason for that was around sustainability. And I think it's, you don't have to make a, a very long draw of the bow to see why BMW was the car maker that actually invested in Lilac's technology, because we can also deliver that sort of thing jointly. Daimler, for example, Daimler mm -hmm. Mercedes, mm -hmm. have had regular jaunts across to Chile, talking to the two big lithium producers there, going, how can we make this better? We like your product but there are issues around water usage, there are issues around uh, social, um, uh, the communities with the access to fresh water. And so I can see that their focus on that is important. So I think that sustainability focus is important together with working with the right battery makers so that we can have a tripartite agreement 
whereby they will grow and we can provide them product, but we're not just a product supplier. We're actually become in an alliance with them. So as they grow, we grow as well. Because we, um, you've heard me talk about the expansion from 25 to 50,000 tonnes. Mm. Now that's really, if you'd asked me 12 months ago, that was just a dream. Yeah. But the demand is there, the debt finance is there, so we're going down that path. And so we want to build that. But we could easily perhaps go again and go to 75,000 tonne span. Perhaps a, a different train. Uh, the second train could well be hydroxide instead of carbonate. Maybe there's some other product that we need to meet for the market then. And we can also develop a second project in that process. Just on, sorry, Steve. Just on that, you mentioned 75,000 tonnes as a potential you know, production capacity. Would that be at Karchi or would that need to be spread across multiple projects, do you think? Well, you've got to walk before you can run. So we have to get um, 25,000 tonnes per annum underway. Yep. But I reasonably expect that we will be building that expansion to 50,000 tonnes mm -hmm. pretty much as soon as we're producing that first 25,000 tonne per annum rate out of Kachi. Uh, we could well go again, but our intention is to develop at least the next project. And I'm not sure if that's Kalchari Olaroz or possibly Paso, but mm -hmm. probably Kalchari Olaroz, mm -hmm. one of those two. Uh, because other participants are coming to us saying, all right, looks like we're a bit late on Kachi, how can we get involved in the next one? Now, why are we focused on that? Our intention is, um, it's an aspirational target, but our intention is to be 100,000 tonne per annum producer by 2030. And we want to be not just a top five producer, but a top three producer globally. The only way to do that is that with those off-takers we're talking about, as they grow, we grow with them. And so as their demand increases, we're able to produce both the product they want mm -hmm. and then have it from coming from different projects. So it's about this like sort of triumvirate of sorts in terms of like that partnership dynamic. You're not just looking like, all right, this is our contract for the short term. It's like, let's grow together. Some time back, we were talking to, <clears throat> excuse me, some nickel producers mm -hmm. and also some graphite producers saying there's a real opportunity to work together if you guys have got sustainability and ESG outcomes to then work together, produce better quality products to go into a battery and perhaps uh, an alliance with a cathode maker or a battery maker. So you've got a, a more fulsome suite of offering to the AV maker and their consumer. That's the way to do this stuff. It's easy just to say, oh, you know, I'm going to dig another hole in the ground or I'm going to develop another project and, you know, name your commodity. Mm -hmm. It's easy to do that. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if you to really grow a company, to be fully engaged mm -hmm. in that development process, that's, uh, that's the critical thing. I think that's such a point of difference, um, which I don't think is very widely understood as well. Standard Lithium and Vulcan Energy, mm -hmm. you've drawn them up as comparable companies uh, before, uh, purely because obviously they, they use a, another version of the direct lithium extraction process. I wanted to ask you and, and to, to get a little bit of a clarification in terms of what potentially the positives or drawbacks are sure. of their version of DLE. Sure. All right, so if we're going to do that, we should also include Livent, which uses a hybrid DLE process, mm -hmm. and then a couple of Chinese methodologies that are being used over in Qinghai Lake and some of the lakes around that over in Tibet. Mm -hmm. So they're all the, the people that are either uh, in commercial production or moving down that path. Mm -hmm. When we were looking at technologies to use three, three and a half years ago, we looked at ion exchange, we looked at adsorption beads, and all those other participants use a type of adsorption bead. We also looked at solvent extraction, we looked at nanofilters, and out of that, we decided based on our particular circumstances, where you've got larger brine projects, but no real energy around, apart from solar power or maybe some gas. Um, you want to produce, but you don't have excess water. So you want to reduce the amount of water uh, that's used. And what we particularly liked about Iron Exchange with Lilac is that because that first step where you're separating out the lithium doesn't actually involve any chemicals, it's an ionic bond, it means that you're not changing the chemistry of the brine, and mm -hmm. so you can re-inject it back to where it comes from. Sure. So based on that rationale, we went down the path of ion exchange, and that seems to have worked out well. Mm -hmm. But if we were in a different setting, we may have gone down a different path. So one of the benefits of direct lithium extraction using adsorption beads is that 
Normally, not across the board, but normally you have to heat the brine prior to the separation out of the lithium using these adsorption beads. Usually it's somewhere between 70 to 95 degrees C. Um, and so if you've got heat, that's a good thing. But otherwise you've got to use all this energy to heat up your brine. Um, against your ESG. Yeah, mm. uh, and, and you've got to look at it across the board. I mean, ESG can't stand by itself. It's also got to be economic. But um, uh, so we're not really in a position where we could easily heat the brine. We could, I mean, we could use more renewable energy to do that. And then the second thing is um, with adsorption beads, it very much depends on your chemistry or the type of adsorption beads that you're using as to what are your recoveries. Um, I mean, I can only, like you, read what Standard Lithium has commented on publicly or, or Vulcan. Um, Livent doesn't talk about their uh, recovery as much. Mm -hmm. Geng Feng is looking at using adsorption beads. We've looked at the, some of the recoveries at the Qinghai Lake. And uh, there's a range, range of recoveries, but, um, uh, but one of the benefits that we see out of this lilac process is on our particular brine, you do get higher recoveries. Now, one of the downsides of the lilac process is it does require more energy because when you strip the bead, you have to use a reagent. And the reagent that we use is HCl, hydrochloric acid. Now the acid immediately gets neutralized because you create lithium chloride plus water, but you're, you're spending money and energy to create that reagent. Now we're going to do it on site, something called a chloralkali plant. One of the real benefits of adsorption beads is you can strip the beads using water. Yep. So if you've got lots of fresh water available, that's great. Mm -hmm. Again, come back to the point, um, we just looked at where those big assets are in the north of Chile and northwest of Argentina. There's not much fresh water available. There's not much power apart from solar. Um, how can we do this so that we're not messing up the basin dynamics? We can actually return most of the brine and we can use a, uh, a cost effective way of doing it. So that's why we went down the path with Lilac. Um, we've been fortunate. It really does seem to work very well. Mm -hmm. Uh, they tell us that they've trialled it on other brines and it also works well, but I can only talk to you about what I know and then what's in the public domain. Um, but if I could summarise all of that, I think as we go forward over the next five years, you're going to see a range of, of um, direct lithium extraction processes. You're not going to see just ion exchange and adsorption beads. You'll probably see more around uh, solvent extraction and different forms of sorbents and, and solvent extraction. And I think you'll probably see water companies who do this all the time, it's just with different metals, the water companies will turn up and they'll also step into the space. That'll get interesting. I it think will. once the price of lithium gets to a particular point, I think oh. uh, yeah, it'll change up pretty quick. So if I could summarize that, what yeah, are we please. trying to do as, as Lake? Mm -hmm. There could well be competing technologies. They may be better or worse, I don't know. Mm. But there's a clear opportunity in the market right now, certainly around 25, 26, mm. there's a massive pinch point. And I think we may get a, oh my goodness, moment fairly soon in the market because car makers have to have batteries in those electric vehicles. Otherwise the consumers are gonna be a little bit cheesed off. Yep. Uh, and so I think these direct lithium extraction processes not only can step into the breach, but they can scale up. Mm. And so we want to do that. We're now in a hurry because we've got the debt support. We've got the equity support. Uh, we're building our team up. We just want to get that underway because if we can then be a key part of that whole supply chain, then we can expand as that market expands. It's a very exciting time for Lake. I think particularly the next say six to 12 months, we're going to start to see you really you know, where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. And I think you're going to see more people start to not see us as just some outlier and yeah, mm -hmm. maybe that'll happen to, oh my goodness, okay, this is actually gonna be a key part of the whole industry going forward. Absolutely. Now we've been saying it for a while, but I mean, it's easy for me to say that, I think uh, as the rest of us start to, to, to hook onto that idea. See, the thing is, Jeremy, mm. I, see, I come from, a farming background, so I'm familiar with looking after scarce water resources. That's, I mean, that's farming in Australia. Mm. And then my first degree was a double major in geology and chemistry. Mm -hmm. And and even in those days, um, you know, it was hard to sort of utilise the chemistry part. Um, 
but I would work in various locations and I would see large companies just not giving enough attention to social issues or environmental outcomes. And it wasn't, I don't think it's because they didn't care, it's because you've actually got to put a bit of attention to it. And when you're doing the exploration or development of project, it's actually front of mind because you're living and working with local communities, you're hearing what some of their dreams, aspirations and some of their concerns are. But when you actually go and develop a project, you tend to bring in a separate team and they go, right, you know, what do we have to do here? I've got a budget, I can't exceed that, I've got these timelines, mm -hmm. and you can sort of lose focus. Yep. And uh, one of the reasons that this whole trip is to inculcate that, that mindset amongst our team. I understand we've got a timeline. I know it's really important that we meet budget outcomes and what have you, but don't lose sight of what's actually important. Because if you do, the whole project will end up getting shelved. And our debt financiers now, because they're coming from export credit agencies, that's mm -hmm. also important to them. Mm -hmm. And our end users, that's also important to them. Um, Most definitely. So they're, they're sorts of things, I guess, mm. that you know, maybe if we had a whole bunch of other projects, uh, it would be different. But um, I, I, I just I can see the whole industry is going to change. Absolutely. I think we're probably just on the cusp of that as everyone's starting to wake up and realise this disconnect. I mean, the share price over the last six months has probably demonstrated that. Yeah, and look, well. the, the three stated direct lithium extraction companies, Standard, Vulcan, mm. Lake, I mean, you know, people go, oh, well, they've done very well. Yes, but there's a reason for that, okay? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not just, uh, it's just suddenly flavour of the month. There's actually a reason for it. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more, as you most definitely know. Um, but in addition to that, Steve, I know you've obviously worked with Novonix, a uh, really great team up there. Um, you know, you've tested your 99.97% purity lithium, which is amazing in their batteries. I know you're waiting on another test. Yeah. Um, in relation to that, you've worked or at least spoken a few times with uh, Jeffrey Dunn, one of the, some would say the goat of uh, lithium ion batteries, um, bit of a prodigy in that space. Can you tell us a little bit yeah. about that? So Dr. Jeff Dunn is one of the gurus of the industry. If we go back 15 years ago, you know, he was, I, look, lithium ion batteries only been around for 25 years, I don't know, maybe it's 27, you know, and 15 of that, uh, he was there at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia, working on new technologies, coming up with new ways to do stuff. Um, you don't see that every day of the week. And then he went and did that work with Tesla. They've certainly come up the curve during that time. And it was great the early part of this year that he came back to actually work with the guys at Novonics. Um, and then Chris, the CEO, Mark, um, they are just, they're really good technical people, but they can also talk to a dumb guy like me and actually explain exactly what they're trying to do in yeah. very simple terms. You've actually got to be quite clever to do that. It's one thing to be smart at what you do, but then be able to sort of fully explain what they're trying to achieve. I'm very impressed with that company, and not just because we've done work with them. I really am very generally impressed with what Novonics is doing. They could see, like us, that there's no anode or cathode manufacturing capability in the US. They're now building on the east coast of the US um, uh, anode manufacturing, and look where they're focusing. Ford has just said, oh, we're going to put some more attention in Tennessee, Kentucky, where are they are, same sort of general area. Volkswagen's around the corner as well. I mean, you know, one could say they're really clever. To be honest, it's not rocket science. You sort of look at where the trends are and you've got to be bold enough to make that. But um, no, big shout out to Novonics. I think that nothing to do with Lake, they are just, a, they're a standout company. I tend to agree, <laughs> which is probably why. I wanted to get your thoughts on that. So thanks for sharing, Steve. One of the final questions I have is um, essentially myself, my audience primarily, we have a really firm understanding as to who you are, your background, Lake's background, your value proposition, pretty much everything there is to know that has been publicly released about Lake. If there was one thing that you would want them to walk away from, you know, watching this interview potentially, and, you know, I mean, just take away from it after this conversation, okay. what would that be? The first thing is don't give up. I regularly get feedback, particularly from funds, oh, your share price is running really hard. And I say, yeah, well, it's got a whole, long, uh, a whole lot further to go yet. 
And of course, that's just perceived as, oh, you know, what the hell else would a CEO say? But there's a reason for that. I mean, when our nearest neighbor live event is a five billion US dollar market value uh, listed on the New York Stock Exchange, they're only producing 16 and a half thousand tons per annum at the moment. Now they do have intentions to be a whole lot higher than that, but you know, we're gonna be at 25,000 tons per annum uh, in less than three years and then going to 50,000. So there's no reason why we can't be at least a five billion US dollar company. So that's one key theme I would uh, put forward. Uh, there's plenty more to come. Second is, um, when we look at where the market is trending, you're going to see more interest in direct lithium extraction and in ESG outcomes. I'm encouraged that, you know, we're now hearing about green steel, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody ever talked about that, even <laughs> 12 months ago. Yeah. Uh, we're now hearing about hydrogen projects, um, green hydrogen projects. And whether that's actually a power source or whether that's just a way of taking in um, uh, solar power and utilising it more efficiently, you know, it remains to be seen because dealing with hydrogen, it's not an easy product to manage. Yeah. However, we're seeing that whole trend right across the mineral resources space. Mm -hmm. As I was sh sharing with you 15 months ago, I would just get people saying, why do you bang on about DLE? Well, because it's a better outcome than traditional methods. Why do you bang on about ESG? Because that's the way the future is going to go. So there will be other things that we'll have to look at. What Lake is trying to do is be constantly either ahead of the curve or at least with the wave so we can make a real difference. We're constantly looking at our product suite. We're constantly looking at how we can develop the next projects because that's how you can actually deliver real value to shareholders. We want to have a value proposition where people make money on their shares, that we actually deliver a quality product that the end user wants with the sorts of benefits so that if I'm driving whatever electric vehicle in the future, I can say, oh, well, I can look at the product suite that's going in there and have confidence, okay, um, we're getting the right sort of outcomes. I mean, this recent protest you're seeing at COP26, mm -hmm. I thought, yeah, some of these young people are going, this is what we want. And there's still people around going, blah, 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 blah not blah. listening. <laughs> and you go, come on. You know, yeah. we can use science. We can make money out of it. Mm -hmm. Chris Sucker, who recently invested into Lilac, he set up something called Lower Carbon Capital. Get your viewers to have a look at that. Okay. Because cool. basically he says, you know, he wants to invest in technologies to lower carbon and make money in the same time. And Larry Fink from BlackRock just came out the other day to say, listen, the next thousand unicorns, the next thousand companies are going to be billion market value. The next other, uh, thousand of those are going to be in climate tech. And that's why we're pushing on this whole climate tech outcomes. Well, we did just see uh, Biden's administration just lock in the 1.2 trill uh, for the infrastructure. All systems are go yep. by the sound of things. <laughs> yeah. All right. Amazing. Well, look, Steve, no. so good to meet Thank you. you Thank you so much for your Appreciate time. Appreciate the opportunity. Really good to catch up. All the best. Thank you.